Welcome to the Beijing Bienenbin Brown Bag webinar series. Beijing Bienenbin is a full-service IP boutique based out of Detroit, Michigan. Today, we have two speakers, Tom Beijing of Beijing Bienenbin and Stephen Dargetts of Mannion, Gainer, and Manning to talk about TC Heartland and patent venue and some of the new movements in where you can file patent infringement cases. So, and Tom, I'm going to start off. Thank you. Today our agenda is, uh, first, uh, I will touch on uh, TC Heartland, uh, focusing on where we stand presently. And then Stephen is going to talk about some of the particulars with respect to the District of Delaware. TC Heartland uh, versus Kraft Foods, ironically, is a case that did come out of the, um, the District of Delaware, decided in, in March of 2017, uh, 8-0 decision authored by Justice uh, Thomas. Um, the issue in TC Heartland was whether the 1957 case of uh, Furco Glass Company uh, controlled venue, or rather the 1990 case, BE Holding Corp, the Johnson Gas Appliance. The 1990 case uh, from the Federal Circuit, BE Holding, was issued as a function part of a 1988 amendment, 28 U.S.C. 1391. <clears throat> where the Federal Circuit held that the requirements for patent venue were the same as the requirements for a personal jurisdiction for a corporate uh, defendant. And the TC Heartland Kraft Foods decision reversed this 27 years of precedent and reinstated the rule in Furco gas, that rule being that the broader uh, concept of residence in uh, 1391C was not incorporated into the patent uh, specific venue provisions of 28 U.S.C. Section 1400B. So venue, the, the basic venue rule after TC Heartland is that venue is proper where the defendant is incorporated, acts of infringement occurred in the forum, and the defendant has a regular and established place of business. Many, many commentators, if you do a Google search, you'll come across literally well over 100 articles on the issue, but many commentators, uh, IP Watchdog, Law 3 60, National Law Review, many others, uh, commented that T.C. Heartland was a reaction to the Eastern District of Texas in particular and predicted that both the District of Delaware and the Northern District of California would have increased popularity after T.C. Heartland. Uh, the District of Delaware in particular because of the high concentration of defendants that are incorporated in Delaware. With respect to the battlegrounds that have come after the TC Heartland opinion, there are two. We'll touch on the, uh, the first one, which is a regular and established place of business the first battleground, and the second battleground uh, we'll talk briefly about, but is more uh, fleeting, uh, there is a battleground of whether existing uh, patent uh, defendants have waived their right to challenge venue after TC Heartland. Prior to the VE Holdings decision, the Federal Circuit had issued uh, the decision also on a uh, writ, the Inri Cordes Corp decision in 1985. The Inri Cordes 
decision uh, arose from a case filed by Medtronic against Cordis in the District of Minnesota. The basic facts of Cordis that Cordis had a couple uh, sales people physically domiciled in Minnesota. Uh, Cordis engaged a secretarial service in Minnesota, um, humorously called I Got It Secretarial that, that supported that function. Cordis maintained inventory within their sales people's um, domiciles to provide emergency or short notice products, pacemakers to surgeons uh, located in Minnesota. Cordis did not have any other sort of physical places in Minnesota. They were not registered to do business in Minnesota, and they did not uh, have any banking functions in Minnesota, as noted by the Federal Circuit. Uh, the writ was denied, and venue was found to be uh, proper. Um, Cordis, and in part as applied to, you know, by Judge Gilstrap in the Eastern District of Texas, uh, has been applied fairly, um, uh, you know, widely, and uh, I say wildly in the PowerPoint because that's what many people accuse Judge Gilstrap of doing. So just in terms of uh, anecdotal uh, information, uh, having an Apple store in the district was enough to satisfy a CEO's home uh, in the district has been held not to satisfy. Uh, Amazon sales have been held not to satisfy. Um, I think that the factors that are under consideration uh, now are, you know, is there a physical location in the district? What kind of sales function do you have in the district? How, uh, what's your level of customer support in the district? Do you have inventory in the district? Does your corporate structure have uh, place uh, subsidiaries in the district and the like? The big debate presently out in the uh, community with respect to venue uh, arises from the Raytheon versus Cray decision issued by uh, Judge Gilstrap. The general facts are laid out in the PowerPoint slide here. Uh, one Cray, Cray sales executive um, working exclusively for Cray within the district for over seven years. Important to note that he was gone at the time of the case. Uh, Cray paid the salary, maintained a compensation plan. They provide reimbursements. They sold, sold products to customers from a telephone number within the Eastern District area code. Um, you know, not certainly not a uh, ton of stuff, uh, and I found it uh, a stretch, if not curious, or curious and a stretch, that it was noted that uh, Cray sold the supercomputer to the University of Texas um, you know, entire system, and while it was delivered at the Austin campus, it was accessed by uh, remote terminals. To me, at least, that is a stretch. Uh, venue was found to be proper, and Judge Gilstrap took the court's decision and created a four-part test, uh, test Factor number one, is there a physical presence? Test factor number two, any representations the defendant may have made uh, with respect to their activities or presence in the district? Number three, the benefits received, what kind of sales revenue uh, were achieved by the defendant as a result of their activities within the district? And number four, targeted uh, interaction, you know, what type of direct solicitations are being made of customers in the district. Not long after Judge Gilstrap issued the four-part test and maintained jurisdiction, Cray petitioned for writ uh, to the Federal Circuit. Uh, the mandamus is uh, interesting, um, and I think within the Federal Circuit, as Many commentators believe, as within the, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, there is a sentiment that the Eastern District of Texas needs to be reined in. 
Judge Gilstrap uh, in particular needs to be reined in, and that our, the flavor of that argument uh, is included in Cray's uh, petition um, to get a writ. You know, they've emphasized that the law is unsettled, and emphasizing also the the risk of not giving any guidance on the meaning of in re, the in recordis decision for many years, you know, compelling sort of disparate application of uh, the meaning of a you know place of business. The Cray petition is supported by the High Tech uh, Inventors Alliance, which includes many high tech Bay Area companies as well as uh, Gilead, all support Cray. Cray's petition includes this interesting chart comparing the facts of Cordis against uh, the facts of Cray. I don't think this is um, too much of a stretch to say that the facts of Cray supporting venue in the Eastern District of Texas are more tenuous than the facts that supported Cordis's status as a defendant in the District of Minnesota. The items identified in the Cordis fact chart come right from the uh, Cordis uh, position. I uh, looked at the customers located in the district. Certainly there were hospitals located in the in Minneapolis and St. Paul that were supported by Cordis's salespeople. Um, and in Cray, and I noted this earlier, uh, the actual Cray system, the computer is actually sold to the University of Texas uh, system in Austin, but the you know, Judge Gilstrap noted that it was accessed by terminals uh, in the Eastern District of Texas. Raytheon uh, opposed the writ and uh, Raytheon is supported in terms of uh, the four-part test by both Ericsson and uh, Nokia, uh, represented by the McCool Smith firm, who is a big Texas firm and has come out very much in favor of keeping uh, cases in uh, Texas. And the fundamentals of their argument uh, are that Cordis is enough that Judge Gilstrap's opinion is within the four corners of the Cordis uh, decision that the procedural tactic of having a writ is pretty strong medicine for a district court judge who is uh, simply following Federal Circuit precedent that has been resurrected. So we'll see how, you know, what comes out of that uh, petition for writ, and I think that there's still going to be, you know, there's going to be some sorting out of what it actually means to have a regular uh, place of business in a specific district. On the waiver issue, uh, the Federal Circuit has weighed in on a writ coming from the Henry Hughes decision in July, July 25, 2017, this was a decision where the writ came up both on Section 1404. Um, the Federal Circuit earlier in the uh, INRI TS Tech case had uh, issued a specific writ on 1404 relating to the Eastern District of Texas. The Federal Circuit didn't weigh in on the writ for 1404 here. The writ also uh, sought to <clears throat> get some commentary from the Federal Circuit as to whether the T.C. Heartland case was a sea change, a major change in the law that would prevent waiver of venue challenges, and the Federal Circuit held in that context that it was not. Uh, there are some who believe that uh, the Henry Hughes uh, case is suggestive that the Federal Circuit's not going to do anything with the uh, Henry Cray computer writ. I, I kind of think that they are going to say something, primarily because of the uh, 
you know, recognized conflict between the Federal Circuit and Judge Gilstrap, but this hasn't prevented uh, many district court judges to comment that, yes, indeed, T.C. Heartland was a sea change in allowing defendants to argue, wait, you know, argue improper venue and get cases dismissed you know, from those jurisdictions. Uh, certainly, the issues that I've discussed over the course of the last uh, 15, 20 minutes are not um, needed where the state of incorporation is the venue in which the defendant is sued. Uh, and with that, um, and the fact that the you know, I've number of cases are of companies are incorporated in Delaware. I'm going to hand the uh, the microphone off to uh, Stephen Dargitz of the Mannion Gainer and Manning firm to discuss some particulars with respect to the District of Delaware. And then, if we have any questions, we can just have all the questions at the conclusion of the uh, seminar. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. This is uh, Steve Dargitz from Mannion, Gainer, and Manning. And as Tom said, it's been predicted that uh, because of TC Heartland, the District of Delaware will soon see a, a rapid influx, influx of patent litigation. And I think that certainly in the long run, there are good reasons to believe that that's going to be true. Um, in the short term, it, I, I don't think that it will necessarily be immediate, both because of all the issues that uh, were, were just raised. Uh, it would not at all surprise me if the Supreme Court well, ultimately has to issue at least one more, hey, we really meant what we said in T.C. Heartland opinion, just as they've had to do with their recent personal jurisdiction jurisprudence. Uh, but the other reason, and I'm not sure why the slide isn't showing up, but um, let me just, just uh, fill in the blanks here. Uh, currently, there are two and a half uh, Article III judges in the District of Delaware. There's Chief Judge Stark, uh, Judge Andrews, and Judge Sleet, who this year took on senior status. Judge Robinson also took on senior status, but then recently retired and is currently in private practice with former Judge Farnan at, at his shop. Um, and so because of that, uh, the, the District of Delaware already had a very high uh, patent docket uh, with probably the, the most patent cases per judge of any district in the country. Uh, and because of that, among other reasons, there is some, some short staffing at the moment, um, if we, and so uh, Chief Judge Stark has asked the Eastern District of Pennsylvania to lighten the load, and, and four judges volunteered to help along with that. In addition, uh, Judge Jordan, who's currently on the Third Circuit and is a former District of Delaware judge, uh, will continue his practice of occasionally hearing district cases from time to time. And there are also a few uh, district of New Jersey judges who have also volunteered to help lighten the load. And they're identified here. There's um, uh, Judges McHugh, Kearney, Goldberg, Hillman, and Kugler. And also uh, Senior Judge Rubrino from the Eastern District and uh, another Senior Judge from Nebraska, Judge Barayon. Um, we also have three magistrate judges who are very good and working very hard. There's uh, Judge Thine, who has the longest tenure on the court, Judge Burke, um, who, and Judge Fallon, who both were appointed fairly recently. We kind of got a, a, a two-for-one deal with the last two. Uh, we didn't think that we were going to get two. We just thought we were going to get an additional uh, magistrate, but we got two. So that, that's certainly helpful. Um, and Judge Burke, in particular, uh, sees a lot of patent litigation because Chief Judge Stark has a practice of automatically referring all of his patent cases to uh, Magistrate Judge Burke for pretrial purposes. 
Um, Chief Judge Stark, it does not come from a technical background. His, um, his dissertation was actually written on the presidential primary system, but he's a very smart judge. He's a relatively young judge, um, and uh, I, I know him relatively well, having uh, been at law school and also in private practice with him. He is, uh, he's, he's a very sharp judge, and he's a very hardworking judge, and he has spent a lot of time uh, with Judge Robinson, uh, former Judge Robinson, developing procedures to help streamline patent litigation and make it more efficient so that uh, the, the cases can flow through the system relatively smoothly. Um, uh, Delaware has long prided itself on its uh, corporate M&A litigation practice uh, down the street at the Delaware Court of Chancery and there's a recognition that the state of Delaware does well when uh, its, it, its, its judges are interpreting the law in a predictive fashion and when cases are handled well. Um, I think that that's also certainly true with the District of Delaware. There's perhaps not the same sense of it being uh, a source of revenue for the state, but I think that all of these judges um, have a lot of, of professional pride in, in doing what they uh, doing their job well and in also reflecting well on on local practices. Um, so you, you've got um, Chief Judge Stark, who's a former Rhodes Scholar. You have Judge Andrews, who was a career prosecutor before being appointed to the bench. And they were not uh, controversial choices. Nonetheless, it, it still took a while for them to be confirmed to their seats. And then you have uh, Judge Sleet, who, again, has recently taken uh, on senior status. So at the moment, we have really only two full-time federal judges, and it's believed that we really need five. Uh, and this, the state of Delaware has asked for an additional judgeship to be created for the district. We'll see if Congress gives us that. But more importantly, there are, uh, notwithstanding that, two slots that still need to be filled and confirmed. and. I don't really have a good sense as to how long that will take. It's not going to be immediate. And so in the meantime, we'll continue to be somewhat short-staffed. Again, notwithstanding that, the judges are doing a fantastic job of working through the, the cases that they have with the manpower that they have. And if you look at uh, Delaware local rules uh, concerning patent litigation, they're, they're not really extent the the Actual local rules are not that extensive. There's a requirement, for example, that a copy of the patent be attached and filed with the complaint, which is relatively straightforward, and a few other rules. Um, Delaware has uh, certain standards that apply to all cases, uh, not just patent cases. One of them is a default standard for the discovery of, of electronically stored information. And so, uh, parties can contract around this, obviously, but in the event that they are unable to agree, uh, Delaware uh, imposes certain default standards. So, for example, um, within 30 days after the Rule 16 conference, you should come up with 10 custodians on each side who are most likely to have discoverable information. You need to be talking about key sources of information and categories of ESI that need to be preserved and how it's going to be produced and whether people are going to use search terms, what those are, um, things of that nature, uh, what your privilege log is going to look like, whether there are certain categories of things that are going to be excluded in their entirety, um, what sorts of uh, information you need to make sure are preserved, uh, what sorts of information people are not going to be on all, under an obligation to preserve, things of that nature. Um, there is there is also, in addition to that, a default standard for initial discovery and patent litigation. And uh, this, I think, was initially, uh, th this was something that Judges Stark and Robinson were doing on their own, and then it just became a default standard applicable to all cases in the district. So the first one is that within 30 days after the Rule 16 conference and for each defendant, the plaintiff is going to specifically identify accused products and asserted patents that they allegedly infringe and produce the file history. Uh, 30 days after that, defendants are supposed to produce core technical documents related to the accused products, 
um, which include but are not limited to operation manuals, product literature, schematics, and specifications. And then another 30 days after that, the plaintiff is supposed to produce an initial claim chart relating each accused product to the asserted claims. And these are initial disclosures, so the parties are going to be allowed to supplement them. And uh, let's see, and then there is also a default standard for access to source code, uh, which is important to a number of patents. And basically, there, there needs to be a standalone computer that's dedicated to this and, and password protected. Um, it's, it's located with an independent escrow agent. The parties split the costs of that. And uh, the access is permitted after, with notice and an opportunity to object to outside counsel and to experts. But you're not to print or copy the source code without the agreement of the producing uh, party or further order of the court. And there are various other requirements to make sure that the things remain secure. Uh, Chief Judge Stark has his own procedures, which you can find on his webpage for non-end of patent cases. Uh, they're intended to address common sources of delay. One of the things he says there is that he is highly receptive to reasonable proposals to reduce number of patents in suit, asserted claims, accused products, etc. So essentially, if you can come up with a way amongst yourselves to make the case shorter and to make it um, easier to litigate and more manageable, he's, he's certainly going to be receptive to that. He's not going to make you do it, but he's certainly going to be receptive to parties being able to work out things amongst themselves. That is going to be a consistent theme. Um, Another one of his procedures, as I mentioned earlier, is that within seven days of him being assigned a case, he will issue a referral order. And under that order, all scheduling matters are going to be referred to Magistrate Judge Burke. Uh, within seven days after that, the plaintiffs are to file a procedures order. And he uh, has set forth in his procedures basically the substance of, of what that's supposed to include. It's supposed to include, among other things, uh, mandatory procedures to be in fo followed in the event of a discovery dispute. And that's supposed to be teed up through a joint non-argumentative non letter from both parties, as well as procedures for a motion to amend and a motion to strike. Again, you, you can see the focus on lawyers being asked to uh, act professionally and not in an, an overly combative manner. And that, that's consistent with historic Delaware practice. Uh, he also provides in his procedures for uh, Markman hearings for a joint claim construction chart with a joint appendix. Uh, and simultaneous cross briefing. So, uh, in other words, each each side will put in its opening brief, and then each side will put in an answering brief. And there's no reply brief unless you have a really good reason. Uh, he has an aspirational goal of issuing our, all Markman rulings, excuse me, and constructing claims within 60 days of the Markman hearing. Then, um, with regard to summary judgment motions, you can make as many motions as you want. However, <laughs> uh, he, he still expects there to be a total of 250 pages of briefing for each side for all case dispositive motions and all Daubert motions. So, in other words, uh, each side gets a total of, say, 50 plus 50 plus 25 with an opening, answering, and reply briefs. Um, the the pretrial order should uh, provide for such things as, as what types of objections can be made, um, whether the court want, whether the parties want the court to rule at trial on objections to expert testimony or, or hold those objections, uh, as well as the total number of hours that each side is, is going to need to make its case. Um, and then post-trial motions are limited to a, a, a total of 20 plus 20 plus 10 pages, and again, that's without regard to how many post-trial motions there are. You're expected to, to fit all of those into those limitations. Um, he has a case management checklist, which um, 
again, it, it's not necessarily a, a rule, but it, it's certainly helpful, and it, it, it's, I think, just uh, a good idea to look at uh, in its own right. Um, so uh, in, in, in the course of meet and confers with the other side, the topics that need to be discussed include um, for discovery, what the core technical documents are, what the parameters of e-discovery are going to be, you know, the, the limitations, number of custodians, any other parameters that there might be, whether native files are going to be produced, those sorts of questions. Uh, whether, uh, how, the, how the court can be helped and how the parties can be helped by getting meaningful interrogatory responses and, um, you know, whether there are issues surrounding the production of source code. Um, with regard to claim construction, again, um, there's I have here a super early hearing with a question mark, and that's because, again, this is something at the option of the parties. It's something that they can consider and suggest to the judge. Again, uh, as he said, he's, he's receptive to ways of making the case easier, if it's going to make it easier. Um, and uh, as well as you know, the number of terms that are going to be at issue, uh, those kinds of issues. Um, narrowing the case, so for example, uh, when a ruling could be made that would narrow the case, is there going to be some sort of early resolution of certain issues and, and how that can be teed up for the judge, as well as a possible bifurcation of the case so that uh, for example, there could be a, a merits trial followed by a damages trial. Um, and, uh, other topics to be discussed are whether there are related cases and what kind of remedies the plaintiff is seeking um, and what kind of information they need uh, to litigate the, the appropriateness of those remedies, whether people are going to need revenue information, whether people are going to need licensing information, what the smallest saleable unit is. Um, so these are these are questions on the hit list to be discussed by the parties. Uh, other issues include whether there will be deadlines for amendments, whether supplementation will be permitted, and if so, how that's going to happen, and whether there will be deadlines whether you need an additional protective order in beyond kind of the standard protective order in his his standard case management order, um, how motions to dismiss or transfer or stay are going to be uh, teed up, as well as motions for summary judgment, and also the interesting question of whether plaintiffs will stipulate to maximum damages in exchange for restrictive discovery and an accelerated trial date. And again, he's not pushing this on anyone, but he's suggesting it as one possible alternative. So uh, I know Judge Stark, and he's not the sort of person to sort of force things on the parties. Uh, on the other hand, he's a, he's a creative judge, he's a smart judge, and he's willing to explore ways of, of making the case run more smoothly. Um, judge Andrews has uh, not a lot posted on his webpage regarding patent litigation. Um, one way in which his standard scheduling order differs a little from Judge Stark is that he provides for a traditional briefing uh, in the sense of uh, the plaintiff will file an opening brief and then the defendant will file an answering brief and there will be a reply and then there will be a sir reply or you, or you might do it simultaneously, um, each side putting in its own opening, answering, reply, and serve reply brief, but you serve that brief, but you don't file it. And then once everybody is done with their briefing, they cut and paste all of their unfiled briefs into one brief. That's the brief that gets filed with the court. Judge Sleet uh, is notorious for having several individual preferences. Um, I think many districts have that judge who you know that you need to be aware of what they want and how they want their case to be litigated. In the District of Delaware, that's Judge Sleet. And so he has his ways, and you need to know what his ways are, and you need to respect them. Um, and just 
for an example, um, uh, he wants parties to request through letter briefing permission to file summary judgment motions. You cannot just file a summary judgment motion on your own in his court, regardless of the timing. Um, he wants you first to uh, brief whether there's even going to be summary judgment briefing before that happens. Um, and that's, that's the one exception to his general practice that he's not going to act on substantive letters and that you need to be filing formal, more formal filings uh, with him to get him to act on things. Uh, so there are several uh, additional visiting judges um, and I think that the general presumption should be that the visiting judges are going to be following the Delaware local rules and Delaware practices. Um, Senior Judge Bataillon has expressly said that that's what he's going to do on, on, on his webpage. Uh, the others haven't said that, but I would imagine that they are going to be doing that as well. At the same time, they also come from their own districts with their own local rules. Um, and I've, I've checked those rules, and they're not really dramatically different from uh, Delaware, don't really conflict with them. But at the same time, I, it's obviously a good idea to confirm with your judge what his individual expectations are going to be and, and whether to, you know, they differ from, for example, Judge Andrews or Chief Judge Stark would want you to do. So in the District of Delaware, um, motion practice is alive and well. Um, I think there's kind of a general philosophy among many federal judges that they don't want to hear motions to dismiss. Let's, you know, let's just go ahead and let the jury decide this. Um, don't spend a lot of time on motions to dismiss. Uh, I don't think that that is true in the District of Delaware. I particularly don't think that's true with respect to Chief Judge Stark. He uh, has an interest in, if there is a way of resolving a case, quickly and efficiently, he's willing to put in the work to do that. Uh, that doesn't mean that he's uh, going to be biased in favor of a motion to dismiss, but at the same time, he's not the sort of judge who will just kind of uh, give it uh, less than his full attention because he has a lot of other things to do. He, you know, he, he's a hard worker and he, he's gonna give the motion the attention that it deserves. So um, some examples of recent rulings on motions to dismiss. Uh, for example, um, in the Jedi text case, Judge Sleet granted a, a Section 101 motion under Rule 12b-6 and uh, rejected the idea that that couldn't be decided at the pleading stage. Um, and then in the smart meter text case, you had Judge Robinson denying uh, a, a similar motion um, in the Blackbird Tech case, you had Judge Sleet, again, granting a motion to dismiss. In the SIPCO case, you had Judge Andrews granting a motion to dismiss. And then uh, in the Paul Tech case, you had Judge Robinson denying a motion to dismiss. Um, and Judge Robinson obviously is no longer on the court. So with the remaining judges on the page, you can see that you know they've all recently granted motions to dismiss. It's, it's something that they're, they're going to be, I think, uh, amenable to if the grounds for the motion are there. And uh, see, the same thing with, with motions for summary judgment. So, for example, um, very recently in the Princeton Digital case, uh, uh, Judge Stark denied in part a motion for summary judgment that was grounded on the level of proof, but at the same time, he granted in part the motion for breach of a covenant not to sue. Uh, and then uh, the day before that, he also issued uh, an opinion in an Intel case in which he denied Intel's motion for summary judgment on indefiniteness and non-infringement, but then uh, granted in part FutureLink's motion for summary judgment um, 
and granted in part Intel's motion for summary judgment of no willfulness and no unclean hands. Um, then in the Enzo case, decided a little bit earlier this summer, uh, denied a defense motion grounded on the written description requirement, but granted the same motion based on a lack of enablement in the patent. Uh, again, uh, let's see, and, uh, and then there are a couple of other additional opinions here where uh, Judges Andrews and Sleet have also granted defense motions, uh, Judge Andrews under the dedication disclosure rule, and Judge Sleet because the plaintiff fail, failed to tailor their proof to the claims as constructed by the court. Again, another good example of making sure that you are cognizant of what Judge Sleet's expectations are and that you are matching them. Um, because if you read the opinion, you can see a certain level of frustration that, uh, in his view, the plaintiff was not paying attention to what he had said in his previous rulings. And th this is probably a good time to bring up uh, just generally the expectations of the Delaware Bench and Bar. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, Delaware has a long history of expecting its attorneys to act in a fairly genteel way. Uh, you're expected to sit down with the other side and resolve things like adults, resolve things like professionals. Um, people do not tolerate what so-called Rambo litigation tactics. And if you are overly aggressive, it, it's not something that the uh, – that the Delaware judges are going to respond to well. And so one really good example of that that's, that's often cited, um, and sort of every young Delaware lawyer has to sit through this as part of uh, becoming a Delaware lawyer, is um, uh, in 1994, uh, the Delaware Supreme Court had an opinion in the Paramount Communications case, Paramount Communications v. QVC Network. It's one of the it's one of the opinions on on so-called Revlon duties, and it's uh, explain it's, it's narrowing time the the Time Warner opinion business a little bit. And the the Supreme Court of Delaware, after going through that analysis has ha added an addendum to their opinion. And it's not, it has nothing to do with Revlon duties or anything like that, but they take very seriously the obligations of Delaware lawyers and of lawyers from other jurisdictions who are admitted in a pro hoc capacity. And so uh, they attached uh, excerpts from a deposition that was taken by the late Joe Jamail or I'm sorry, defended by the late Joe Jamail uh, of Texas, and said that he, quote, abused the privilege of representing a witness in a Delaware proceeding in that he, A, improperly directed the witness not to answer certain questions, B, was extraordinarily rude, uncivil, and vulgar, and C, obstructed the ability of the questioner to elicit testimony to assist the court in this matter. And they actually, and they actually quoted uh, some of the questions and answers, and it, you know, it's, it's a fair summary of what was going on. You had objections being raised, such as, I'm tired of you, you could gag a maggot off a meat wagon. That's, that's the type of behavior that Delaware judges are not going to tolerate, whether they're state judges or federal judges. And just to uh, give you a kind of a, a case study of that or show, showing how this can work in practice. There was a recent patent litigation, W.L. Gore versus C.R. Bard. And a, a report came in fairly late in the case. And C.R. Bard represented that they had recently learned information. That's why the report was late, et cetera. Uh, W.L. Gore accused C.R. Bard of sitting on the report and deliberately producing it at the last minute to quote unquote blow up the trial. And there were, there were various hearings that were held on the matter and 
Judge Stark heard heard testimony from various witnesses, and ultimately he was satisfied that yeah, this was not maybe not best practices, but it wasn't anybody deliberately trying to blow up the trial. It wasn't people lying to him. W. L. Gore, however, continued to litigate the issue very aggressively. They accused attorneys of having basically not told the truth in their submissions to the court about the expert report. They accused people of pulling a sealed file from a court in Maryland. There were statements made that uh, that. As, as Judge Stark said, could have been potentially career-ending if he had accepted those allegations. And so uh, while he, he credited Gore's representations that it initially filed its motion for sanctions in good faith, um, because you know, based on the circumstances, the report came in late, it looked a little fishy, they had a right to file their motion. It was what they did after that. And, how they just wouldn't let it go despite what the testimony was that he believed was credible. So he he found Gore's continued aggressive pursuit thereafter of its serious accusations, despite completely unrebutted evidence to the contrary, warrants requiring Gore to reimburse Bard for its reasonable attorney's fees incurred in connection with opposing the sanctions motion. Uh, and he says that from from the point after filing its brief, uh, after Bard filed its brief, Gore multiplied the proceedings in an unreasonable manner, increasing costs by intentional misconduct. And this was all before the trial even got started. And so, it, you know, in addition to being ordered to, to pay sanctions, W.L. Gore was not starting off on a good foot. So I think the lesson there is clear that, yes, you, you should be a zealous advocate and you absolutely need to represent the interests of your client, but you need to be very careful about how you're doing that. And things that might be acceptable in some jurisdictions are just not going to be acceptable in Delaware. Um, so moving on to um, other cases of note, uh, kind of in a similar vein actually, that uh, you are important for you to know about. Um, they kind of relate to the area of discovery. And in particular, there are some significant opinions relating to the obligation to preserve documents. And as we all know, uh, the Zubulaki doctrine that originated in the Southern District of New York has been getting a lot of attention over the last 10 or so years. And that, you know, the, the era when you could just say email, what's that is, is of course long gone. Um, but uh, the the issues, the, the opinions that have been coming out of the District of Delaware have tended to involve conduct that is beyond uh, kind of simple negligent failure to uh, preserve things. So, for example, uh, for a long time, the most important opinion within the state of Delaware, including the state courts, was the Micron case that, that came out of the District of Delaware back in 2009. And what happened there was that during a period when Rambus was anticipating litigation and preparing for litigation, but prior to the date when they notified their litigation target of some patents, they engaged in a company-wide shred day. And that was actually the second shred day. Um, the first one, you know, arguably occurred during a period when litigation wasn't yet reasonably foreseeable. But the second shred day, according to the court, there were, according to Judge Robinson, there was no doubt about that. And they also instructed their outside patent counsel to purge their patent files. So again, we're, we're talking about basically a deliberate deletion of relevant, potentially discoverable information in anticipation of litigation. And Judge Robinson saw that, and she she basically was horrified and said that the least harsh sanction she could impose to prevent unfairness to Micron and to deter similar misconduct was to declare 12 Rambus patents unenforceable as to Micron. So there can be very serious ramifications indeed 
if one of the local judges believes that you are, are not complying with your obligations to preserve relevant information. A more recent example of this is in the GM Net, GN Netcom case. That was last year before Judge Stark. What happened in that case was months after a litigation hold went out within the company, there was a vice president who was, respond, who was replying all in email chains and saying, everybody should delete this email. And he was also definitely deleting his own email. And when people tried to find his email in other custodians' mailboxes, it wasn't always there. Uh, the company supposedly made attempts to recover the emails. Judge Stark wasn't convinced that those attempts were adequate. And so because he found that there was willful spoliation, the burden shifted to show that the other side had not been prejudiced and people were una unable to meet that burden. And so he awarded sanctions, which included a permissive adverse inference instruction. In other words, the jury wasn't told that they had to conclude that, uh, there w that they should draw an adverse inference, but that they could draw an adverse inference from that, from the spoliation of documents, as well as a $3 million punitive uh, sanctions award. And that was basically um, the, the, the defendant had imposed on this vice president their own internal penalty of a million dollars for deleting his email. And Judge Stark said, well, there's been an argument made that that's kind of a windfall to them from this guy's bad conduct, and I, I kind of see some sense to that. So he, he basically awarded a, a treble damages award of punitive sanctions, as well as the cost of demotion, and said, yeah, and, and, and you might not even be done. I'm, I may have additional evidentiary sanctions. Uh, let's see. Trying to move to the next slide here. Um, and then another recent uh, sanctions opinion was the, the Bosch opinion. And again, this was much more run-of-the-mill sort of stuff. This was just basically uh, a, a failure to respond to discovery in a really adequate way. Um, and he denied a motion to dismiss that was based on Rule 37, but he did order that the discovery be made and, and ordered the payment of, of fees. Then um, some other uh, discovery-related opinions obviously include um, waiver of privilege. And there have been a couple of fairly recent opinions where the court has ordered broad subject matter waiver based on an advice of counsel defense. One was in the Princeton Digital Image case that I mentioned earlier. Um, and Judge Stark found that the plaintiff had put privileged communications at issue selectively and so, you know, you can't use privilege as a sword and a shield. Um, people tried to, to re-argue the motion. That motion was denied. Also, uh, in the recent Johns Hopkins case, Judge Robinson and Judge Fallon uh, ordered a, a broad subject matter waiver based on an advice of counsel defense. Then uh, another case that's uh, noteworthy is the Takeda case, uh, and this was decided by Judge Stark back when he was serving as a magistrate, um, and he yeah, he actually joined the bench a little earlier, uh, I think it was back in 2007, he was appointed as a magistrate after having served as an AUSA in the district, and then in 2010 was appointed to replace uh, uh, Judge Jordan when he went up to the Third Circuit. Um, and this was a case where uh, the defendants had shown good cause for production of ESI for an 18-year period, very, very long period. And But on the other hand, plaintiff had shown that once you went back more than five years, the information was not going to be reasonably accessible. And so this is this is a textbook example of the judge ordering cost sharing, uh, and so what he did was he ordered that all the um, production of ESI for the entire 18-year period needed to be produced, 
but subject to cost sharing. So if um, if the if the company with the information had to go out and get a vendor to restore the information because it wasn't reasonably accessible, uh, they were only going to have to pay 20% of that. And the party seeking the information was going to need to pay 80%. And that's a good way of, of getting people to, to get a little reasonable about things when they have to pay 80% of the costs. Um, you know, at that point, it's not a, well, you know, let's turn over every rock. Um, that, that, that's a good way of getting people to, to think about what they're doing. Um, and so uh, that, I think, gives you a, a, good, uh, a, a good summary of, of what the District of Delaware is all about. Um, as I said, you know, we're not fully staffed yet. Um, we have two and a half judges. We really should have five. Um, it took a long time to get Judge Stark on the bench back in 2010. He was actually the second person nominated to the post. Um, uh, the previous nominee, uh, Colm Connolly, was actually nominated by George W. Bush, and that nomination was approved by Senator Carper, but not by Senator Biden, and so it sort of languished. And then as payback, it took a while for President Obama to name somebody to, uh, to the same post. Uh, but Judge Stark was so completely non-controversial that he ultimately had had no trouble being confirmed. It just took a long time to get to that point. And I, I hope you uh, found this information uh, helpful. Thank you, Steve and Tom. Um, if there are any questions for either of our hosts today, we have our chat and our Q&A open. Um, we'll leave here running short on time, so we have time for maybe one or two quick questions if there are any available. Seeing no questions, I'd like to, of course, thank Tom and Steve for their talk today. Um, and thank you for listening to our webinar today. Um, Bijan Vienemann is a full-service IP boutique based out of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, this video will be posted up on our YouTube channel, um, if not very soon. And you can find these slides at our website at e2iplaw.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>